From Microbe TV, this is TWIP, This Week in Parasitism, episode 135, recorded on June 20th, 2017. This episode of TWIP is brought to you by Blue Apron. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. See what's on the menu this week and get your first three meals free with your first purchase with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash TWIP. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello. Joining me here in a very sunny and warm New York City, Dixon De Pommier. Hello there, Vincent. Nice day, isn't it? It's fabulous outside. Also joining us from a remote exactly. location, <laughs> Daniel Griffin. Hello, everybody. Good to be back. Hello, Daniel. We can see Daniel here on our Skype we monitor. Can. We can. He looks uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, as it were. He has the monitor glow. He does. I wonder if that can give you a tan. <laughs> it, well, I don't know what the UVB uh, index is, actually. Daniel, are you Okay. Not, you know, I don't think Irish pe- So there's an Irish word for suntan. I don't know if you guys know it's what that is. It's called sunburn. Lobsterism. <laughs> and Daniel, yeah, we're, we're always are you, very liberal. Are, have, you been, have you been well, Daniel? Everything good? I actually have been doing quite well. My wife has had a cough for weeks now. I think it will never go away. Hmm. Uh, hmm. You know, but myself, <laughs> I'm doing very well. By yourself. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. I want to tell you about the ASM Grant Writing Online course. Mm. Learn the best practices in grant writing during this online course. Participate to receive an overview of the funding landscape. Learn what makes grants successful and receive personalized feedback on your grant proposal. Seven-part series that will take place online in the fall of 2017. So you don't have to go anywhere. You could sit at your computer. But you do have to register and the deadline is coming up July 15th. Go to bit.ly slash ASMGWOC17 to learn more. That's bit.ly slash ASMGWOC17. Maybe I should take that course, Dixon. I'd rather take a course called Grant Getting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who gives that one, but I'd like to take it. <laughs> now, uh, we should welcome you back, Dixon. You should. You were... Gone for two episodes, correct? I was, I was. Welcome back, Dixon. I, I listened to both of them, by the way, and I enjoyed both of them. Hey, we missed you. I, I felt missed, actually, but I had a great time. I was in Africa, mostly. Where South- there are lots of parasites. There are tons of... In fact, there was an outbreak of malaria in um, Limpopo, which mm-hmm. is a district of northern South Africa, and... Um, what kind of mosquito would that be? Dixon? That would be an Anopheles mosquito. Were you bitten at all on your trip? Several times, but not by much. What we did <laughs> have much. an incident. We did have an incident, <laughs> which is worth repeating. Though our car that we rented, uh, as I passed through a toll booth, somehow the tire got slashed. Really? Right? It looked like someone took a knife and just cut it, and it went flat the moment we exited the the toll booth. Mm-hmm. So we had to pull over to the side of the road, of course, to fix the tire. While we were doing it. The sun was setting. This was an, an, a fascinating uh, turn of events, basically, because at the time it was so beautiful. The sun was setting. The air was crisp and clean. And and there was a gigantic termite mound right next to the place where I pulled over to the side of the road. How big? Like three it feet? Big. It was big. It was at least four feet tall. And the alate termites were exiting from it and flying in all directions, including all over us. Take so, a picture. <laughs> we, I, I take, no, we were very frustrated. So you had to that, change the tire yourself. I had a cha- well, with the help from my wife, of course. I mean, we had to unpack the entire car to find the spare tire. Thank God there was a good spare tire, so we could continue our trip without yeah, having to yeah. take the car back to the airport. And uh, wow! But to see those alate termites was fantastic. Just A-late? amazing. A-late? Alate. They're winged termites. They they do this when the nest gets overcrowded. Hmm. And so in order to make room for the next generation, the, this generation flies away and forms another termite mound somewhere else. Interesting. Yeah. So we, we actually were a part of a phenomenon of nature during our... And they landed on you. And they landed all over us, yeah. And were you freaking, freaking out? Uh, no, well, uh, Marlene thought they would bite first, <laughs> but they didn't bite. So you asked me if I was bitten by anything. The termites don't bite, so they were fine. In fact, we were told that they're kind of sweet when you eat them. 
<laughs> of course, you're not wood, so they're not going to eat you. No, that's right. Exactly. That's what right. they do eat, right? They do. Hmm. Daniel, you ever been in this part of Africa where he was? I have actually, and um, I had a couple of thoughts that came you know, across my mind as you saying, what is, is just sort of the whole neat idea of renting a car in Africa and just being out <laughs> on the roads driving, right? I mean, it's just, mm. it's, it's, it's a wonderful it was experience. Fabulous. It was fabulous. You know, get, get away from the tourist hotel, get That's away right. from all That's those right. mini buses in a circle around, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. a bunch of uh, hungry and thin uh, animals during the dry season and get out on the roads. <laughs> well, we um, did that. We did that. And I, I drove the entire trip, which was almost uh, two and a half weeks and uh, ended up in some very remote places. Uh, we went to some place called uh, uh, Simbabili. Simbabili. Uh, it's it's uh, Simba is the word for lion, and Bambili is the word for river. And Sabi Sands was where the Sabi River and the Sands River come together, and they formed this uh, large consortium of resorts, which is contiguous with Kruger National Park. So all the animals can migrate in and out at, at free will. Mm -hmm. There's no mm -hmm. poaching because they've really tightened up on the security. Imagine this. There are people that they hire to sleep out in the bush mm -hmm. and stay out there the whole time. To do what? To, to catch poachers. Ah, I see. And they're using drone technology now. The poachers are. No, no, no. They, well, they both are. <laughs> you're you're <laughs> right. The, the, the poachers are using drones to find the elephants and the rhino, and the the guards of these places are using countermeasures, including drones, to find the poachers. So it's a cat and mouse game. And in this case, the cats are all big and they can kill you. We had a great time, though. We saw the, um, lots of Poaching stuff. will not stop until the animals are gone. Well, there was an alternative to this that I heard about, and that is to raise rhinos in these game parks and then harvest the horns mm -hmm. and sell them. And then let them out? And let them grow back. So how, how would a rhino do in the wild without a horn if it's properly They're fine. removed? They're, They're okay? absolutely fine. They're absolutely fine. Because the poachers just cut it off and kill them, right? That's right. They, they shoot them. They shoot them. They cut it off and they because leave. Because you can't go up to a rhino and say, excuse me, may I have your... And they don't fall off every year like the animals do in the United States and the Northern America where they, the deer and the uh, antelope play. What so about an elephant tusk? Could you harvest that also? You could. Without It'd hurting the elephant? Well, they don't let you do that either, so you'd have to dart them. And there's a, there's a chance that they would die. It's it's a difficult situation all the way around. But but the the one I heard about that was made the most sense in this one game park. It was actually the second game park ever established, and by the same people that established Yellowstone National Park. So mm -hmm. Teddy Roosevelt mm -hmm. and some other people, when they were in Africa, decided to do the same thing for the rhino as they did for the American bison. So it was quite interesting to hear all these stories, and uh, we just saw so much. You know, it doesn't have to be in the wild. There was a zoo recently where a guy jumped in and killed the rhino and took a tusk. Uh, right? Exactly. Corn. exactly. It's a crazy world out there. It's, it's wow. a horrible stuff. But, but in general, it was a very upbeat and very uh, positive trip that we took. Yeah, the, ter the termite thing, I was also going to jump in because I had a case where there was this history of this woman with all these bug bites and and then they, you know, she does whatever she's supposed to. But every time she goes back, she ends up with more bites and they find termites in among the clothes. And so there was this whole interesting issue is because, you know, in their mind, you know, the termites biting her while sleeping. Um, but according to the the entomologists, the bug guys yeah. um, and gals. Um, termites don't bite people. Correct. Uh, so. Correct. Except for Woody Allen. <laughs> Woody, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that was a bad joke. No, and, and, Woody, and, Woody, and Woody, Woody Herman. There are two people that termites might attack, and that's yeah. Woody Allen and Woody Herman. And another thing I'll say about the parks is, you know, why why are there all these big areas in Africa that they could turn into these parks? And it's, you could say, thanks to our parasitic friends, right? Yes. Um, a lot that's, of these areas could not be cultivated. They couldn't use them for animal husbandry because right. of the parasitic diseases that's keeping right. um, people out. Exactly. And now what were these you know, horrible areas that no one would want to go into because of the <laughs> risk of death from sleeping sickness or many of the other maladies are now these beautiful, fantastic um, treasures. Correct. Yeah, the, the places where we were just were spectacular. <clears throat> and, and we actually saw a pangolin which is a very rare spiny anteater that's native to Africa that's becoming extinct because of uh, her medicine practices in China, of all things. So crazy stuff is going on, but uh, there is hope. We have three follow-ups. 
We do. Daniel, can you take the first one? <laughs> sure. Wink writes, Vincent and Daniel, I am willing to bet that you would not pass the toxo slash sex slash internet study if it came through an oversight committee you were on. If so, why give it the twip, bump, wink, Weinberg in Atlanta? That was from the last time, right? the paper you and I did? Yes. yes. I, think, I think, Daniel, the answer is that we did two papers. One, a, a very good, a well-planned study, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we wanted to contrast it with a lot of the other stuff that's out there that people always cite as reasons for toxo-altering human behavior. And we wanted to show, look, this is really not a good study, and that's the problem with is, Does that make sense to you, Daniel? Oh, I think that's exactly, well, well, I should say was my point. I can only guess at your motivation, Vincent. <laughs> <laughs> hey, and I listened to that while I was sitting here watching animals behave in front of me at the resort I was at. <laughs> so. No, but I think, it, I think it's interesting. There's, you know, when you, I think particularly when I move into the clinical realm and people come and see me and they have ideas about parasites and how the parasites might be affecting them in certain ways, it's important to realize that, yes, you can find anything you want out there, but it's important to actually find the truth, right? And so um, yeah. the area of toxoplasmosis, there's anything you want is out there to support whatever ideas you might have. Um, but what we really want to know is we want to know the truth. And so we started off with what I think, as, as you um described it, Vincent, was a really well done, careful study. You had objective documentation of whether or not people were infected or not with toxo. Then you had systematic questions that had been administered without a bias. So people didn't actually think that maybe something they say would support a hypothesis that they might have an investment in. And then we contrasted that to a really um, peculiar uh, study with a lot of sort of interesting um, Topics and uh, yeah, and and I and I hopefully we sort of you know we're we're critical enough to uh, to not be bumping that, but maybe doing the opposite of sort of saying that you know these are the things that are out there that even though they're out there, even though they're published, even though they've gone through you know IRBs and peer reviewed um, processes, not necessarily something where you the conclusions are supported. <laughs> here, uh, here. So. Here, here. All right, Anthony writes, the Prenz Lucky Number 7, Unprenz, worms collected by Dixon de Pamier, then in his technician phase, 1962, from the woman in the hospital were tapeworms, not flatworms. And then he gives a reference to a uh, an editorial comment that I made on the article. Actually, tapeworms are flatworms, but they're segmented flatworms. They're not unsegmented flatworms. Were you a technician in 1962? I was. So yeah, he's got it. He's got the data right. He's twip good. six. That's when you described. Yeah. Remember waiting for this woman. That's right. The, no, I and she, she would never forget. She that. gave out seven. She gave out seven. Tables. So I think Daniel, you and I referenced that that last time the uh, disease, of course, was Ascaris. Yeah. Right. And that wasn't the case with you. So we, I, I yeah. might might have been me who said, "Oh, Dixon did this once, but it wasn't you." No worries. Okay. No worries. But but I just wanted to correct the, the, the impression that tapeworms are not flatworms. They are flatworms, but they're segmented, segmented flatworms. flatworms, yes. Got it. Yeah. But actually, you, so you, you bring up something interesting that we talked about in your absence, Dixon. Um, Vince and I talked about. I heard that. all those comments, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and you weren't, weren't there to jump in and be. No, no, I wasn't. Like, uh, <laughs> but I wanted to. Were you screaming? Were you just, were you screaming? Yeah. Not, no, no. I was just uh, murmuring. I murmured. <laughs> Yeah. Probably the animals were. I didn't want to disturb the animals. They were wondering what you were talking about. <laughs> no, it was, yeah, it was very entertaining to listen to. Yeah, but the ascaris, right? You can get lots of ascaris oh, yeah. uh, where the tapeworms are a little more territorial. So often there'll be a single tapeworm infection. This is true. Um, or a limited number. Actually, five right. is quite a bit, in all honesty, uh, as far as numbers. That's right. Um, but so these were all shortened. They were not. Uh, they were not fully lengthened tapeworms. So there was some uh, evidence that a they were are all acquired at the same time and they began growing at the same time, and yeah. their growth was stunted by the presence of all the others because there wasn't enough to go around. Mm-hmm. That's that's the impression we all had. 
it's interesting, right, that that wouldn't happen more often. Because think of yeah, uh, think right. of the amount think of the amount of tapeworm oh, eggs that right. a person might be exposed to. So one getting in, sort of setting up shop and keeping everyone out, is probably a competitive situation in almost all infections. Right, where, well, the cystocircus is what we're going to eat here. So maybe the yeah. ingestion through the meat wouldn't include a whole bunch at once. So maybe that's why we're getting yeah sort of the yeah exactly the eggs would be another question of course. Yeah, because then the eggs you're gonna you could end You'll up with quite a burst. circus. That's right. Yeah, and that's that's a horrible problem. All right, our last follow up is from Noah. Last time we had received a photo of a <laughs> cellophane sticker test for pinworms. It was all written in Chinese, and Daniel and I said, "I wonder what this <laughs> means." So Noah Wright writes Chinese text printed on the sticker test cellophane. The first bit of Writing is day one. Okay. And the second bit is check cellophane for pinworms. Great. So he gives the Chinese characters as well as the the words that you would say. I'm not going to pronounce yeah. them because yeah. Yeah. I will totally get them wrong. <laughs> so that makes sense. Day one. Sure. <laughs> and then check cellophane yeah. That's it. for pinworms. Very straightforward. Right. All right. That brings us to our case from last time. Uh-huh. Daniel, bring us, uh, give us a little bit of a refresher. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, let's see. Woman, oh, I'm going to actually read Vincent's little synopsis here. So, case TWIP 134. For those of you um, listening for the first time, clicking on in, and those of you returning, uh, let me remind and introduce a woman in her 30s. Uh, this is a case that I saw was out in Colorado, and she came in to be seen because she was having foul-smelling loose stools multiple times each day uh, associated with cramping and nausea. Uh, this had started a few weeks ago. Uh, she doesn't report any fever. This is uh, during the summer when she comes and sees me. Doesn't report any unusual travel, just um, heading up into the mountains, hiking, backpacking, uh, going to the ski towns. Originally, she was from the northeast part of the United States and moved to Colorado about one year back. Uh, I think I would mentioned she'd met a bunch of uh, local Coloradans who were introducing her to the outdoors, taking her up backpacking and overnight camping. Um, occasionally drinking from the streams, uh, but reports that she was treating the water with iodine. Um, on the overnight trips, they, they do pack food, and they were cooking with these small camp stoves. A uh, little further information that the stools were, were sticky, sort of trouble getting herself clean afterwards. Um, there was the pointed questioning that she responded to, yes, my stools do float. Uh, the color, she says, not quite as dark, so sort of lighter than usual, but well-formed. Uh, no medical problems, no surgeries, no allergies, not taking any medicines on a regular basis. She lives alone in a private home. Uh, she does drink beer. Uh, and then I say, no, I don't, is beer considered a toxic habit? I don't know. So drinks beer, Depends but no toxic habits. <laughs> uh, none of her friends report any similar symptoms. She is sexually active, but uses uh, barrier contraception. And the physical exam was, was unremarkable. I just want to remind everyone that Dixon had a great idea before the show that we're going to give a book away. Yes. To those who get it right, we're just going to randomly pick one of you. Right. And this will be for the next That's set. right. That's so right. So we'll give you more information later. We will. So you can win a nice book. Which book are we going to give? Either 6th edition. Right. Or People, Parasites, and Plowshares. <clears throat> Why not? Because D- Dixon said... Might as well give them something for their Absolutely. education. All right, the first one is from David. Dear hosts, <laughs> although the hiking woman from Colorado featured in TWIP 134 uses iodine tablets while drinking water from streams, the symptoms she presents seem to point to a classic case of giardiasis or beaver fever. She likely caught the parasite on one of her summer hiking expeditions after drinking stream water contaminated with the infective cyst stage of the giardia parasite. The Giardia trophozoites colonize the duodenum and jejunum in the small intestine and prevent host nutrient absorption, which causes gastrointestinal symptoms such as sticky, foul-smelling, fatty, diarrhea or steatorrhea, abdominal pain, and nausea. Cysts are then passed into the environment along with feces, and the life cycle can continue. Diagnosis 
where this parasite can be obtained through stool examination, ELISA testing, and an entero test using a thread in a gelatin capsule <laughs> that has one end taped to the inside of the patient's mouth. The thread is later extracted and examined for the presence of trophozoites. Treatment for the normally self-resolving giardiasis include a nitroimidazole medication such as met- metronidazole, which is considered a first-line therapy by the CDC. However, there has been recent evidence of drug resistance developing in Giardia. Thank you once again for the informative and educational podcast. Sincerely, David is in the Molecular Helminthology Lab at Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. Excellent. Wow. Excellent. So, so wait, Helminthology, and here he is, even an expert on a protozoan. That's, that's remarkable. This test, <laughs> it, it, the capsule is taped to yeah. your mouth? It's called a string test. Yeah, it is. And it, do you swallow it, and then they pull it out of your stomach? That's, no, it goes all the way to the duodenum. Oh then the is capsule this, dissolves. Daniel, is this used actually, Dan? <laughs> it's so I, I've got to read a sentence from our latest textbook. The string <laughs> test, which involves swallowing a gelatin capsule attached to the end of a long string, is now relegated to a place in history right. uh, as newer, right. better tolerated diagnostic techniques right. are becoming available. Right. But yes, you're right, actually. It's sort of <laughs> silly. Uh, these poor people would swallow this, and then they would have the string taped to the side of their mouth. Um, we actually um, still will occasionally do this for pH testing right where they'll have something sure. down there that's mm, sure. and um yeah you sort of don't really want to go out in public um, yeah. with a piece of string they do it overnight it. when you go to sleep and uh, in fact they used to do it routinely for strangulodiasis to make that diagnosis yeah so yeah and we used to show the demo in the labs because we had a little handheld uh, movie that you could turn the handle on and you could watch people swallowing the capsule and it would go down and Kids would all run it backwards to watch the capsule coming back up and again. <laughs> they had more fun with that than they did actually learning about the parasites. Yeah, Dixon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dixon, can you take? I'll try. It, Octavio, right? Why would you try? Well, because one can only try. There Dear, is no try. <laughs> okay, <laughs> do okay. or do not. This is going to be the, you, only, Yoda. <laughs> the only attempt. <laughs> oh, Yoda. Uh, prof- dear professors, about a month ago, I came across the podcast This Week in Parasitology and has since become my lo- loyal, entertaining, and extremely educational travel companion during my usual three-hour-long driving around beautiful Portugal place where I send you my warmest regards from and I must add an editorial comment right here because Portugal just recently had a tragic uh, mm. wildfire that yeah. killed over 60 people. Wow. And uh, that was that was awful. I hope that uh, is over with now. I am a veterinarian and after a few other professional sidesteps, and I felt compelled to write you today after hearing Professor de Pommier introdu- introduction in the first episode of TWIP when he answered to Professor Racaniello's question on why he became a parasitologist. His answer had to do with doors opening. A great story with somewhat of an emphasis on the importance of being at the right place at the right time, which, in my opinion, seemed to neglect all the work, dedication, and talent the professor has. (laughs) You had me read this. I see why now. A sentence ascribed to Thomas Jefferson goes like, I'm a great believer in luck, and I find the harder I work, the more I have of it. And I believe this is also the case for Professor de Pommier, as with illustrious Professor Racaniello and Professor Griffin. As I said, I had a few other jobs before, and in order to become a veterinarian, I was a tomato paste factory worker, worked in a restaurant kitchen. I was and still am a certified commercial diver, working in private security. I held a couple of office clerk jobs, managed a bookstore among other survival experiences that, in some cases, thankfully, time ensured to blur out from my memory. Nowadays, and since 2013, I'm working for a veterinary pharma company as a lecturer on their products, particularly ectoparasiticides, the big fat teat on which 40% of all the vet pharmas gladly suck. Smile. As long as there are fleas and ticks in this world, there will be business. And that's not only because of the extraordinary biology, adaptation, and resilience of these amazing and terrible creatures, but also because of the incredible misinformation, lack of information, or as I find more frequent, utterly bewildering ignorance of the common citizen on the matters of parasites, parasites of their pets, external or internal, and parasites of their own. 
I get a great uh, pleasure and reward from what I do because even within the constraints of a commercial activity, I feel that every time I speak with someone, a pet owner, a pharmacist, a veterinary colleague, technician or nurse, an over-the-counter retailer or whomever, I do my best to share with them my knowledge. It is a microscopic knowledge when I compare it with the likes of you three gentlemen. I just hope it may be a microscopic embryonated egg of knowledge that I can have on my listener's mind and that it may hatch into something useful and with relevance for the one health just as you do with TWIP. You do a truly great service, and I learn every single time I listen to you. Please keep on infecting us with your embryonated eggs of wisdom. Oh, that's a great, I love that phrase. <laughs> so that... So that this already long message is just not a kilometer long drooling over your exercise, <laughs> I would like to add my hunch on what may be the cause for TWIP 134 case study, the fatty buoyant feces. <laughs> my guess goes to Giardia duodenalis, probably contracted due to the consumption of water, not completely treated with the iodine tablets this patient referred using, a situation described in the 1997 paper by Gerba, Johnson, and Hassan, Efficiency of iodine water purification tablets against cryptosporidium oocysts and giardia cysts, see attached. The epidemiological cycle is another case that reveals the intricate connections between human and wild fauna. In Urquhart's veterinary parasitology, it reads, There is evidence from the USA that giardia from man, which gains access to municipal water reservoirs, may successfully infect wild animals, especially beavers. Then these act as a source of contamination of domestic water supplies. Giardia trophozoites, Greek trophos, the feeding state, should be the, resp should be the responsible one for the duodenal or jejunal and ileal epithelium villi flattening with compromise of intracellular tight junctions leading to malabsorption and steatorrhea. Cryptosporidium would also be a suspect, but it was... It's an, it is unusual that immunocompetent individuals should develop clinical disease. The definitive diagnosis could be established by fresh stool smear examination, despite difficult, because the, despite the difficulty of it, because the protozoans are very small, approximately 15 micrometers. But it may not be passed even in every sample, and this sample must be examined within 30 minutes after collection. Patients and systematic methodology are required. They are, nevertheless, very beautiful to watch. I would agree with that, actually. In cats, we have an ELISA fast test for giardiasis, so I imagine quite more sophisticated kits exist for humans, including DNA amplification techniques. If the diagnosis is confirmed, the anti-flagellated anti-protozoan antibiotic metronidazole could be used to the treatment. That is all for now. I bid you farewell, and I am yours, parasitologically, Octavio Caracac. Parasitophically. 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 That's right. Parasitophically. Octavio Caraca Piera. Postscriptum. Piera is my surname, and it means pear tree. Almost a de Pommier's cousin. <laughs> <laughs> my middle name, nevertheless, Caraca. It could be read Caracas. Carasca. Carasa. Carasa means tick. Nice. Yes, I have a veterinarian named Tick who works with ectoparasites. I would not go so far as to say what Professor said about chance, fortune, fate, or fado, but it is sure, but it sure is quite a gag. A, a that was a wonderful. Veterinarian named Tick who works with <laughs> ectoparasites. That's right. Dixon, is your middle name Tick? No, it's not. My middle name, unfortunately, turns out to be Donald, which reminds everybody of the fact that we have someone else by that name. But no one knows it's Donald. No, and I didn't say that, so therefore my middle name shall remain <laughs> from hereafter unknown. That's a lovely <laughs> email. Yeah, it's a great yeah. email, actually. I enjoyed reading it. I feel his, his humor as he's yeah. writing this, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Daniel. John writes, Dear Doctor's Twip, I think that the woman with the light colored, foul smelling, sticky floating stool from Twip 134 has giardiasis. The description of the stool seems to match steatorrhea, presence of ex excess fat in feces, which is characteristic of giardiasis. She had cramping and nausea, which are also associated with the parasite. She also consumed water from streams during camping trips, which may have been improperly treated. Diagnosis can be made by direct microscopic observation of the 
trophozoites or cysts in a stool sample by ELISA antibody test or by the delightful, though possibly obsolete, <laughs> string test. The string test involves swallowing a gelatin capsule attached to a string. The string is taped to the subject's cheek and the capsule is digested and travels down the gut. The string remains in place for several hours and is then withdrawn and the absorbent string is examined for trophozoites or cysts. Lovely. <laughs> According to Parasitic Diseases 6th Edition, treatments for giardiasis include metronidazole and tinidazole as well as bromomycin for pregnant women. Regards, John in Limerick, Ireland, where today the weather is 15 degrees C with torrential rain after oh, a week of clear skies and 23 C. Uh, Yes, we, you know we have a lot of Irish sailing coaches, and they were they were saying that back in Ireland it's just been uh, pouring lately. Wow. P.S. I was listening to the team on Twiv discussing a paper a few episodes ago, and Vincent mentioned that two of the authors had ascaris. My first thought that flashed into my head was. <laughs> That's an odd thing to say, but albendazole or ivermectin should clear it up. <laughs> of course, what it actually said was that the authors had asterisks, asterisks, <laughs> asterisks. Okay. Worms of totally see. different so, color. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were just joint first authors. <laughs> I've been infected by TWIP. That's great. That's amazing. The authors had asterisks. <laughs> Poor authors. Asterisk. I think it's funny. So, oh, this will clear it up. Isn't Asterisk the name of a dog, too, for a Tintin? Isn't that Tintin's oh. dog's name? Asterisk? Asterisk. Asterisk, the gall? The, the dog. So, name of Tin, Tin's dog. You know who would know that, right? Our, our Snowy, no? Is that right? Snowy is the right name. Yeah. So, who is Asterisk, then? Asterix, the gall, was, is a <laughs> comic. All right. Yeah, but what is it a comic of? Um, is it a, another person? Hold on, I'm looking it up. It might be a, the Inspector Asterisk. Asterix the Gaul. Asterix. Full, of course, being some French thing, right? I guess. G-A-L-L or G-A-U-L? <laughs> G-A-U-L. Well, All right. it's loading slowly, so we'll come right. back to that. Right, right. Uh, Marsha writes, Giardia Lamblia. Period. That's it. <laughs> That's all she writes. Mm. <laughs> no explanation. <laughs> Johnny writes, good morning. As always, a pleasure to listen and learn. As I listened to the case study for TWIP 134, it struck me that a more objective description of the patient's stool might have been helpful. Dr. Griffin, do you ever use the Bristol stool chart? I found it very helpful in pediatric and adolescent medicine as a way of clarifying what a patient or parent is describing as abnormal. It is also something medical students and huh. residents find interesting and hopefully useful. I've included two examples of the school chart. There are many others that may be more or less appealing. Now to think more about the clinical scenario and possibilities. Best from Boston and Cambridge, where it is currently sunny and 18C. Johnny, your Cambridge pediatrician. And Cambridge, uh, Johnny never got back to I was going to say. <laughs> so what's the diagnosis? He didn't get it. But uh, Daniel, what is the Bristol stool chart? Oh, yes. <laughs> so, you know, this is one of those funny things in medicine, right, where we uh, take uh, bodily uh, expulsions, shall I call them? Um, what, what do they call them for parasites? Uh, things that are exuded or – but anyway, for humans, there's something called the Bristol stool chart, and it takes your feces and it, it classifies it into seven different types. Okay, Seven? Just like seven. viral Just, repro repro reproduction strategies. <laughs> Yeah, so so when people talk about, you know, they say that, you know, the northern native uh, tribes have like 30 different words for snow. I'm like, you know, we have seven for feces. <laughs> and uh, so, so the, the, the type one is basically I'm a deer. I'm having like little hard lumps. Uh, uh, yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm a deer. <laughs> so. Nice. And then um, type two, it starts to get a little lumpy and we'll say sausage-like. Um, and then type three and four, these are these are the ranges of what are, are you know, say in the middle of the bell curve, the normal, which is uh, sausage, sausage shaped, maybe some cracks in the surface. Type four, it's starting to get a little smoother, sausage or snake shaped, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then um, and then type five, we're starting to get into these soft blobs. 
type six is sort of mushy and then type seven is liquid. Right, um, right, right. Uh, you know, I... I, the, so this so character you know I, I don't usually chart like you know type five stools occurring three times a day or anything like that um, but I will use uh, descriptive verbiage um, when um, characterizing someone's feces the other thing that that maybe is important too is quantity yes and, and frequency and frequency um, that's for sure you know, because I That's often right. hear somebody say, oh, I had some horrible diarrhea. I had this one episode this morning of horrible yeah, diarrhea. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, so you had one loose stool, which in my mind is very different yes. than I'm having a loose liquid bowel movement sure. you know, five, six times a day. I would think too much hot sauce <laughs> the night before, <laughs> you know, for the tacos. If you had tacos with hot sauce the next day, you're going to suffer for it. And uh, sometimes it comes out as a stool. But uh, that's a one time only deal. Yeah, I mean, people, I think, sometimes push the different um, Bristol stool chart classifications, um, you know, the type 1, type 2, questions of not enough fluid or exercise, um, the type 5, where you're sort of getting soft blobs, um, yeah. maybe the person needs to eat more fiber, sort of they're at the edge of normal, sure, but not sure, quite. Sure. And then the idea is when you're actually really having liquid um, and you're having multiple episodes of liquid, then you're starting That's to get different. some sort of an inflammatory or irritation irritant process right uh, so right uh back to asterix the yes. goal yes. It is a yes. the first volume of the asterix comic strip series okay all right so it's a comic strip which is um it's a character asterix the goal is the first volume of the asterix comic strip series by rene gossini and albert uderzo <laughs> it is very popular Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> all Gaul, the plot is all Gaul is under Roman control except for a village in Amorca, blah, blah, blah. So you can right, read sorry, about right, it. Anyway, right. it's a comic book. Oh, okay. uh, Dixon. Yes. You're next, I think, JB. Uh, JB writes, hey, hey, doctors. <laughs> That's a good start. Uh, I'd like to make a guess about the case study for episode number 134, the woman from Colorado experiencing weeks of foul-smelling loose stools. The duration of her symptoms, as well as a few other facts in the case, has me leaning towards a specific diagnosis. Floating, light-colored stools sounds like classic steatorrhea, and excess fat could also lead to an increase in stickiness. Many parasites can cause malabsorption in the intestines that could lead to steatorrhea, and some of them are waterborne. What strikes me is that even though multiple people drank from the same water source, she became ill when her fellow hikers did not. Had the entire party gotten sick, I would have suspected cryptosporidium. From what I've read, standard iodine disinfectant procedures aren't very good at killing some crypto. But uh, if there were a lot of cryptocysts in the water, most everyone would likely have been infected. The fact that only one, only she got sick, and that only she drank from out of her water bottle leads me to believe that she did not practice sterilization as thoroughly as she may wish she had done. So a fresh waterborne parasite that is easily killed by thorough iodine sterilization and causes weeks of foul-smelling statorrhea? I'm going with a diagnosis of beaver fever, a.k.a. giardiasis. Thanks for all the great work, and here's to many more wonderful episodes. All right, uh, we have a for our next an audio file. So let me try to see if this works. I hope you hear it, Daniel. I'm excited to listen. Here we go. Hello, Dr. Griffin. Professor Bracaniello, TWIP listeners, and Professor de Pommier, assuming you are back in time to participate in reviewing listener feedback to diagnose the case from TWIP number 134. Just a brief refresher. In that case, uh, the patient was a 30 ish uh, young woman uh, who presented uh, to the doctor uh, reporting diarrhea. If we try to create a candidate list of uh, parasites that uh, have diarrhea as a symptom, uh, using a parasitic diseases sixth edition, you know, as a framework uh, <laughs> supplemented by uh, the CDC uh, website, uh, we'd identify you know, four major uh, possibilities. In alphabetical order, they are uh, number one, uh, cryptosporidium. Number two. Cyclosporensa, sorry, Cyclospora 
Calientinensis. Uh, it's a bit of a mouth and tongue twister. Uh, I practice it many times without the benefit of an official TWIP pronunciation guide. Uh, number three, Ensamoeba <laughs> histolytica. And number four, Giardia lambia. If we look at some of these, we can knock off uh, one or two of them relatively quickly because uh, although they are consistent uh, with the symptoms, uh, they fail in other major ways. Uh, the first to knock off is Cyclosporata, sorry, Cyclosporata cayentinensis. Uh, the reason for this is, as uh, recorded in uh, the uh, text, it's uh, only uh, seen around 15,000 cases a year in the United States. And uh, most of these are from travelers returning from impoverished regions in Central and uh, South America. So uh, I think this is a pretty easy one to uh, you know, discard, you know, as the uh, case history uh, is uh, pretty clear that uh, she had not done any traveling recently. So, uh, okay, it's a possibility, but unlikely, gone. Uh, the second one that we can, I believe, confidently ignore is uh, Entamoeba histolytica. Why is that? Uh, yeah, intermediate, while well, sometimes maybe symptomatic, uh, in patients who do suffer uh, symptoms and report, uh, there's a key element that's missing, namely uh, they have blood in uh, their stool and feces. Um, in this case, uh, there's uh, you know, a lot of discussion about the character of uh, the patient's feces. Uh, no blood was reported, so this can safely, in my opinion, be discarded. Um, even if it maybe it is uh, the cause instead of what I will nominate, uh, since this and my cause both have the same drug as treatment, uh, I, I think it is uh, safe uh, to discard this and move on. And this will come back in my follow-up question at to the end of the diagnosis uh, that I send back to the TWIP panel. So we're down to uh, the remainders are Cryptosporidium and Giardia. You know, here, if we take a look at more of the detailed uh, symptoms uh, reported uh, by the patient, uh, she reports foul-smelling loose stools, cramps, nausea. Uh, she reports sticky stools. Uh, these are consistent uh, with uh, symptoms of Giardia. Uh, in past episodes, oh, several years ago, back in, I think, the early teens of episodes, uh, when Giardia was first presented, uh, Dixon introduced this term steatoria uh, as uh, describing the character of uh, diarrhea. You know, specifically, when you dig into it, the definition it is basically it's loose stools, it's stools that float, it's stinky smelling stools. Uh, these all result from the fact that uh, they're much higher in uh, you know, oils uh, that are not absorbed uh, in the small intestine. So in this case, uh, we have a match on uh, smelly stools, loose stools. Uh, and since uh, the patient was obviously paying attention to what was in her toilet, uh, her lack of reporting any blood or blood coloration, uh, I think uh, leads us to safely uh, eliminate uh, crypto uh, you know, as a cause. So there we have it. You know, Four possibilities, three down, uh, Giardia, uh, Lamblia, you know, such a wonderful sounding name for, uh, you, know, you know, for a parasite that causes these horrible symptoms. Uh, if we look down the list, there are other matches in terms of you know, classic symptoms versus those reported uh, you know, by uh, the patient. Um, stomach cramps, she reported cramps. Uh, she did not report fever which is commonly reported for crypto. So I believe for all of these reasons, uh, you know, we can you know, eliminate three out of the four candidate lists and feel confident that uh, Giardia is the cause. Uh, there's other environmental factors that would tend to corroborate that. Uh, the transmission route for uh, crypto uh, typically requires transmission through sheep or cattle as an intermediate host. Uh, all we know from the woman's case history, you know, sorry, case history, is she's going up into the mountains, she's sleeping, backpacking, and she's drinking uh, from streams. So uh, this, you know, besides you know, not having enough symptoms, uh, the transmission mechanism just doesn't match. So 
uh, another nail in the coffin of eliminating crypto. So we're left uh, pretty much uh, with Giardia. The treatment for Giardia is metronidazole, and uh, that should uh, should be uh, should be the uh, recommended uh, cause. Oh, sorry, recommended treatment. Uh, a couple other comments uh, looking at the case history is that the notes were that uh, she treats the water with iodine. According to the CDC site, uh, for you know, treatments uh, and precautionary measures uh, campers can take, you know, for Giardia, uh, use of uh, iodine is not really recommended. The, uh, the CDC you know, comments that it's uh, relatively you know, you know, infrequently effective. Uh, preferred uh, countermeasures are filtering water or boiling, uh, and uh, in their site they provide information about how many minutes you should boil based on your elevation, uh, because um, you know as we know at uh, lower altitude, higher altitudes, less air pressure, water boils at a lower temperature, uh, so you need longer time, uh, you know, to uh, get to the benefits of uh, boiling as a tool for sterilization. So. I give her an A for effort for using iodine, but uh, it just uh, wasn't effective. Uh, it would be information. Curious to know in the rest of the party where they report uh, that she has other friends that she's been, uh, you know, mountaineering with. Uh, if any of those report it, uh, I believe Daniel said no. So that makes me wonder: Are they uh, using different, uh, you know, preventative measures uh, when they're drinking, or maybe they're not drinking? Um, because again, it's noted in the case notes that she's originally from the Northeast. So there just may be subtle uh, behavioral differences uh, while out in the wild that uh, maybe her friends unfortunately did not observe to be able to uh, caution her to help uh, prevent a case like this. So that's my diagnosis. Uh, Giardia and uh, treatment is uh, metronidazole. The question I want to fling back to uh, the TWIP studio is to ask uh, Daniel how a doctor would think about uh, doing a diagnosis uh, in a case like this. Um, you know, there are a number of uh, symptoms. Uh, I would assume a doctor would pursue a thought process like I did of eliminating some of the possible but unlikely uh, causes you know, based on uh, you know either a checklist or ultimately some sort of you know, probability assessment that uh, they don't match. Uh, but uh, the thing I'm really curious about is in a case where uh, you have two possible uh, causes, you know, either uh, you know, entamoeba you know, or giardia, where they both have the same treatment, uh, metronidazole, uh, as a practicing physician, would you request additional tests you know, to further diagnose or confirm a hypothesis or in this case, since they have the same two uh, drugs, or same two, uh, have the same uh, treatment, would you go ahead and start a treatment uh, and then either dispense entirely with or would you, uh, additional diagnostics or would you start treatment and then do additional diagnostics just to confirm it uh, afterwards after the fact? So i um, curious about uh, uh, how uh, MDs are trained you know, to think and weigh these uh, various uh, probability assessments. Uh, as a follow-up question, um, I note uh, from this, I went back to a TWIP episode uh, 85 shortly after you joined the show. And in that case, uh, again, it was a similar you know, shootout between uh, is it crypto or is it Giardia? Uh, in that case, it was crypto. Uh, but there you commented that uh, uh, because, again, this was your, you know, your case, you were in Fort Collins, that you had mentioned in that show that you had seen a number of cases of Giardia. Uh, and personalize it and volunteer that you had suffered too a uh, giardia. Uh, wants me to ask the question, uh, and this is speculation, I'm sure, on your part, but how would an MD say in an urbage region like uh, Los Angeles or Manhattan uh, you know, think about uh, this uh, diagnosis versus uh, you know, a doctor in a rural environment or a more rural environment like Fort Collins? So I'm really trying to drive to understand um, in medical education, since diagnosis is dealing with probabilities and assessing it, uh, we all have, or M each MD has their own personal 
uh, experience you know, that informs their probability assessments. Uh, how would that vary uh, across the country between urban and our rural uh, regions? So um, guys, uh, I really love the show. I've learned a hell of a lot. I really appreciate uh, the free uh, availability of the PDF of uh, the sixth edition of Parasitic Diseases. I wish you uh, all the best and uh, you know, wish you uh, many years of uh, continued shows going into the future. Thank you and bye-bye. Lovely. I, I presume you heard that, Daniel. <laughs> what? What? <laughs> no, I, I heard it all. Actually, it was, I, I, there was a lot, of, uh, a lot of really great content there and um, I think some thought-provoking questions. So <clears throat> I'll jump in first by responding to some of the uh, uh, some of the questions, I guess. So how how does a clinician approach this? Um, but you know what? We should probably read the one last email, and then I can jump sure. in. Sure. Go ahead. Go ahead, Daniel. We still have an unveil. We still don't know what it is. No. Uh, so I'm going to read this last email <laughs> from Yosef, and then I'm going to jump back in. Um, so Dear TWIP team, it's from Yosef, uh, David Off, who we know from Hofstra School of Medicine, and Yosef writes, my guess for this week's case is that our patient has a Giardia infection. Cryptosporidium and Giardia can both be obtained from dirty stream water and are more resistant to iodine treatment than most organisms. The giveaway is the fact that this diarrhea has been going on for a while and that the stool has turned fatty. The diagnosis can be made with the stool O&P or an ELISA. Treatment is with metronidazole. Sincerely, Joseph Davidoff, Hofstra School of Medicine, class of 2018. Um, P.S., and we have an attached photo here. I found this picture of Giardia that I think would have been more appropriate a few months ago, <laughs> but it was too good to pass up. And I think he's referring to Valentine's Day, perhaps. Yeah, I perhaps. think so. <laughs> <laughs> Scanning right. electron micrograph depicting Giardia, Lamlia, protozoan undergoing binary fission, creating what appears to be a microscopic heart. Lovely. That is. Lovely. It is. All right. Good guesses, well, I, I, everyone. Before we respond, I should find out what you guys think this woman has. Uh, go ahead, Dixon. What did you think? Well, you know, I was sitting in <laughs> Africa when I listened to this, and I... Is right, Giardia in Africa? Are you kidding? Giardia's everywhere. Giardia knows no borders, just like all the other parasites we talk about. <laughs> For the most part, there are some borders that are vector-determined, um, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. but the parasites themselves can go anywhere that the patient goes. So, you know, my first uh, impression was immediately Giardia uh, lamblia because the symptoms are classic. I would say these are classic symptoms. So, uh, but you still have to definitively diagnose this in order to make the decision definitive yeah. before you begin treatment. That's what I would do, but I'm not a physician. I, I think we're waiting for our physician component to weigh in on this. Yeah, I also thought it would be. Giardia, based on the symptoms, the, especially the stool, yeah, and the uh, the situation, the exactly. drinking stream water in exactly. particular was in this farm. Now I didn't that's think right. of crypto. No, no, you, so that's a good. You point. know what? Usually, physicians don't get this much information from their patients either. They don't. They come in, they have diarrhea, they give a stool, they leave. Sometimes they interview, sometimes mm -hmm. not. They do it in outpatient clinics. And the next thing you know, you got the diagnosis and the, the treatment, and you're off. So why wouldn't you have thought crypto? Oh, because it wasn't a watery stool. It, it wasn't at okay. all watery, and uh, that's, that's typical for crypto. Got it. All right. Um, so the, the first thing I'll say, and, and you know, there was the questions that Mark was raising about how are physicians trained, how do they approach this. Um, I was in the hospital the other day, and I heard uh, one of the more senior docs say, if I hear from a medical student one more time, how is this test going to change management? <laughs> and, <laughs> and, right. you know, and it, it's very interesting. Um, medicine, as it moves in certain ways, um, there's this idea of, oh, actually knowing what the patient has, but if it's not going to change management, who cares? And actually, I have to admit, I share the same um, – I don't know, negative reaction, I'll say, when um, 
when there is this idea that we shouldn't actually diagnose people, we should just treat syndromes. And so here is a, a, a diarrhea syndrome. Let's let's just throw like a cocktail of drugs and they'll get better and we don't even know what they what they have. I I, I hope never to practice medicine that way. That's not and, practicing uh, medicine, by the way. That's it, just, well, you know what, I mean, I could be, do that. <laughs> yeah, that that would be the interesting thing because you know, we, we call it practicing medicine and it's that idea that you're constantly learning, you're constantly getting um, redirected and you know, this is that comment I always make about a, a doc without a lab is like a feral dog. If you're not right. doing diagnostic tests, you're not going to know, are you making the right diagnosis? Right. Um, so you'll, you'll start treating, you know, you'll see, oh, watery diarrhea, watery diarrhea, I gave them some flagell, they got better. Well, they may, maybe they were going to get better anyway because you're treating cryptosporidium, right? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and they're going to get better anyway. And so um, I am a big fan of actually making a diagnosis. Yeah. And so um, ha- how do we do it? So the first is, you know, okay, I will admit not every doctor has this box. Um, being judgmental um, because it will make them a better doctor now and it will make them a better doctor in the future. Uh, the second is um, you don't want to be giving people um, antibiotics or any of these drugs unless they really need them because uh, there was a recent study in, in one of the journals that came out saying about 20% of people who receive an antibiotic have an adverse reaction. So these are these are not innocuous things that you're throwing at people. Wow. Um, so you really want to make sure that you know what they have and then do it. Now, the nice thing of the timing of this case was um, we were moving. This is a case when I was still out in Colorado from um, having to look at a stool sample every other day for times three to try to find these guys, hopefully getting them, as mentioned, fresh so you could still see the motile trophozoites, um, to the ability to use a stool antigen, um, ELISA test. And that's actually what was employed. So here it was, I took the history and you know, I usually take pretty thorough histories, um, and maybe it's just just because I'm curious, and you know, I, I, I want to know, and I'm always looking for something not just that's going to help me diagnose this patient, but something that maybe is going to educate me and make me a better doctor. And so, you know, some of the stuff that I got from this case, which I thought was interesting, was here's a whole bunch of Coloradoans introducing this woman to the mountains and she's got diarrhea and they don't. And that was not the only time I heard that story. So I have some thoughts about why that might be the case. Mm. Um, And then, you know, getting the fatty stool and then whether or not she has a fever, because as I saw over time and then sort of found support in the literature is that a percent of the time people with um, Giardia will have systemic symptoms. So to, to give people the diagnosis, she had a stool, Eliza, which was positive for Giardia. Um, so I was able to start off with a compelling history. Um, I was then able to confirm the diagnosis with a, um, with a laboratory test. In this case, it was an Eliza. Um, looking for the actual Giardia antigen in the stool. Um, now, today, um, most of the time, we're actually moving to nucleic acid tests, and there's actually a number of these um, actually sort of syndrome-specific testing modalities where you basically say, hey, there's a bunch of things that might um, be causing this, and you send off like a biofire, a film array, uh, these different multiplex uh, nucleic acid tests to, to tell you or basically help you identify the pathogen. Um, once identifying the pathogen... And just to give more to Mark, different parts of the country will have access to different tests with different ease. At Columbia, um, I'm seeing lots of cool stuff in part because of the availability of the biofire film array approaches. Um, When I was in Colorado, you sort of had to think your diagnosis and then go to your ELISA to look for the antigen. Um, In most parts of the country, you're going to have access to either of those two tests. People often order the stool OVA and parasites, ONP, um, but it's tedious. It takes trained um, personnel. Um, the stool needs to be fresh. Often you won't see it in every stool, so it may have to be serial um, serial tests. Dixon, you you, I'm sure you looked at a lot of feces in your in your time as a lab tech. Tell me about it. Yeah, well, I spent <laughs> um, the first year of my professional life bent over a microscope uh, looking at a patient's stool samples. Absolutely. And I, I didn't get tired of doing it either because it's an adventure every time you look through the microscope and you never know what you might see. So, um, And I saw lots of new things that I'd never seen before. 
and some old things that, that reassured me that I was uh, still competent to recognize the old things and, and differentiate them from the new. But uh, you're right. We had four people that were all engaged in stool examination throughout the day for maybe 40 to 60 stool samples that were sent over from the hospital daily. So that's a lot of expense. But I, I have a question for you because now that life has changed – and the physician has its battery of DNA-based uh, tests that they can order that rule in or out the major diseases that cause diarrhea. Do you think this lowers the ability of the clinician to discriminate on the clinical symptoms? And they just, well, I don't have to know that anymore because I can just send this test off and it'll come back positive. I am. Um, I worry that that's the case, actually, because, you know, I do see sort of the syndrome testing approach. Oh, patient has diarrhea you know, problem number three, solution, right. order the exactly. you know, syn syndrome-specific test. Um, my hope is that there's going to be a, a sort of a reverse education to this, is as we saw with the um, nucleic acid um, testing strategies, the multiplex approaches for viral um, diseases, we're okay. starting to mm -hmm. get a better understanding of the <laughs> spectrum of um, – viral manifestations. Yeah. And then hopefully what we're going to start seeing here is, you know, you had classic cases like this where the person had um, steatorrhea, they'd been in the right situation. I think we're going to start seeing what would have been thought of as atypical manifestations of Giardia because of the syndrome testing. And we'll start to understand a broader, broader spectrum of pathology. Sure. Do you think the other people from Colorado went on to that uh, horrible state that we wish no one ever went on to, and that is they became asymptomatic carriers? So interesting. What what I would see is, is a syndrome like this over and over again, or a situation like this, I should say, where you have these native Coloradoans who are then up in the mountains, and they're not getting Giardia, but the newcomers get it. And I, I think there may actually be a, you've had Giardia once, um, a certain resistance to reinfection. But as mm -hmm. we do know, a certain percent of these people are chronic carriers. Right. And so they're, they're part of this perpetuation. Right. So maybe beaver hunter fever, <laughs> <laughs> you know, because uh, when you're in the woods, so to speak, and you're um, doing something recreationally like hunting or fishing and the urge to extrude some symbionts, as I call it, rather than actually <laughs> defecating, because they're very helpful <laughs> for many reasons. You shouldn't shouldn't diss the uh, stool exam or the, the stool itself because they're your friends. Those are your friends. They are helping you digest your food and make it passable so that you can actually eat again sometime. Um, I have deep respect now for the microbiome that's been revealed by uh, the molecular biologists to us as a, as a thing of beauty, to be honest, um, and to be uh, cherished that we have such wonderful friends helping us with our own bodily functions. So, um, yeah, you, you tend to go in the woods, basically, just like the bears, <laughs> you know, and when you do that, you have the option of contaminating the environment and introducing the parasite where it never was before, so... Uh, it works both in both directions, right? So beavers certainly can become carriers of this, and other animals too, by the way. that's They're not the only ones, but they are some of the ones that have been identified. But people, I mean, I, I would just venture to guess that there are many more people out there in the world than there are beavers. <laughs> so there are probably more infected people in the world than there are infected beavers. <laughs> and therefore, we are prime suspects for for distributing this parasite in places where it usually never existed before, but we can go in anywhere we want and we can certainly defecate every day. So why can't other animals pick this up from us? And so that's, that's how these things get uh, worked around the world. No, I think there, yeah, if you do the math, there are many more humans. And in some populations, right, 10% of the population might be Giardia yeah, that's infected. Right. That's it's, right, that's right. So the, the percent of people that are carriers actually seems to be um, affected by nutrition status, maybe uh -huh. different, you know, genetic factors. Because right. it's hard to separate those out. Yep. But so you see in certain populations pretty high um, rates. And then there's issues about impacts that might have on learning, et cetera. Um, mm hmm. 
And so, um, and, 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 you know, I've never, I've never actually found, I've always looked for a really good um, study on, you know, people who've been exposed growing up in GRD endemic areas. Do they develop, truly develop this resistance or am I right. just right. sort of observing something? So it'd be interesting. You know, that's, I think yeah. why I take these histories is I'm hoping to get some ideas and then, sure. you know, I can't research everything, but somebody might want to look at that. I'd yeah. be very curious. Um, the next is the treatment issue. And, uh, and this is, you know, some some people would see a situation like this, and you know, you see a lot of this actually when I was practicing in Colorado, where you know, hopefully you're you're confirming the diagnosis, but you know, going ahead and treating with uh, metronidazole or flagyl, um, and uh, you know, you're supposed to take it um, either five to seven days, three times a day, or there is the tenidazole where you just do a two gram boom, just one, one dose. Um, but I saw a patient actually was interesting, sent to me, um, last week. And this was a patient that had been diagnosed, um, with Giardia treated in New York city. Um, symptoms had persisted. Uh, the, the doctor had tested again. I mean, this doctor actually did a very good job. The person still had Giardia even after treatment and then sent them to me for what do we do now? Um, and so, what do we do now? Um, uh, I actually went ahead and treated this person with a second-line agent, and um, I'm going to actually be checking on them tomorrow to see if they cleared. But unfortunately, we seem to be seeing uh, increasing resistance to metronidazole. Right. And I think I think I was actually – you were involved, I think, at Columbia in the identification of the first um, metronidazole-resistant uh, yeah. Giardia. No, it, it wasn't Giardia. It was Trichomonas. Um, Trichomonas. Okay. Yeah, but that's another anaerobic infection that's treatable with metronidazole. So, mm -hmm. so that – yeah, I sent that over to uh, Miklos Mueller, who was a world expert on Trichomonas and, and on the me mechanism of action of metronidazole as well because it, it doesn't – directly act on a metabolic pathway it has to be um, metabolized first and then it changes its configuration and then it's effective as a drug so that that mm -hmm. that change occurs inside the organism so that's the uh, basis for the resistance the drug is not changed inside the organism and resistant uh, uh, mm -hmm. organisms and therefore the drug doesn't it isn't effective and by the way yes, it's, it's also effective against anaerobic bacterial infections so the similar yeah. pathways for anaerobic bacteria um, will respond very nicely to this, too. So, for instance, uh, the big confusion came about when uh, amoebic abscess okay, of the liver was treated with metronidazole. And in many cases, it didn't turn out to be due to amoebae, but rather to some bacterial infection. But it was still treated positively, and they got better. So they ascribed the illness to entamoeba, but indeed there was this uh, other organism that was causing the problem. Yeah, and that would be another case, I would say, where it's critical to know the diagnosis. Because, Absolutely. You know, a patient right now that I'm treating for an amoebic abscess, I uh, know for a um, pyogenic, so a bacterial abscess, uh. but let's say, let's say it was, let's say it was an amoebic abscess, and you did not know, you wouldn't necessarily treat the luminal phase, and so no, this person right. would that's still right. That's right. be at risk. That's right. Um, so this woman was treated with um, with the metronidazole, got better, all was good. And the gentleman that I'm I'm seeing now is uh, I've got him on nitazoxamide. We did the three day um, BID. Yeah. Works through a slightly different um, pathway. It's going to affect electron transfer, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, will be curative. But uh, you know, this is a fairly common pathogen. I was actually surprised when I was reviewing that I hadn't presented a case yet. <laughs> so. Uh, so what's remarkable is that this organism <laughs> first appeared in the drawings of um, Anton von Leeuwenhoek, <laughs> mm -hmm. yes, <laughs> who yes. was one of the co-discoverers of the microscope, and here we are still talking about it as though it were uh, discovered yesterday because it's still causing problems, it's still with us, and it hasn't gone away, obviously, and it's not going to go away either. So, uh, in some areas, I dare say that it's probably going to be considered a normal inhabitant of the microbiome of the, <laughs> of the patients because because of the fact that it's so common. All right, that's wow. it. Are wow. we done? I think so. I think that's it. You know, life cycle quick, right? You get it through the oral ingestion yeah, and sure. uh, the iodine treatment. Um, what a lot of people do—they throw the iodine. It's freezing cold water. They shake it up. They drink it. That's not going to help. No. You're really going to have no. to. Um, once you ingest it, then it's going to um, basically uh, affect, as discussed by the microvilli, going to create this malabsorption state. Exactly. Um, 
and you're going to pass stuff out and pass it on to the next uh, unlucky person. Yeah, so these filtration devices are better at uh, drinking yeah, water. Yeah, I, I used that once on the, a... The porcelain filters trip. are yeah, excellent. Yeah. And, uh, so um, <clears throat> you shed these into the environment. You, so you shed cysts. Cysts, and they're very way. stable, right? They are. Well, you said trophozoites too, but they disintegrate the moment they hit fresh water. And the cysts you ingest then, yeah. and then they, they replicate. That's right. They That's grow. right. That's Got right. It. They're quadrinucleate. How long can they persist in the environment, do we know? Oh, uh, well, they have some studies on what they call the Schmutzdecker layer Schmutz of uh, yeah. treated sewage, and they've recorded a viability up to months mm-hmm. afterwards. Mm-hmm. So in some situations, they're quite long-lived. Are there any other situations where this is transmitted other than drinking water in the wild? You mean like sexual uh, transmission so, or vectors? So there is, yeah. Food. There is, yeah, yeah, sure, there are certain food sexual. Yeah, sure. Sexual transmission? Yeah. Certain sexual transmission involving sort of, I'll say, oral anal contact where you can actually get trophozoite transmission. Exactly, right? exactly. What about, right? What, so that would well, be unique. Yeah, I, I, I would... I would take, ex- I'm sorry, to have to <laughs> yeah. inject the fact that if you ingested trophozoites, they would be disintegrated in the small intestine, in the sm- stomach. Well, you so you cysts, think it's, it's, it's only about, cysts. Yeah. They're right. infectious. I think that's the true. What about food preparers? Is yeah, you know, food, food handlers. Absolutely. You know, mm-hmm. you, you go into the, to the washrooms of restaurants and it says employees yeah. must wash hands before returning to work. And uh, doesn't say anything about the customers, of course. <laughs> but but that's yeah, preparing food. That's one. Yeah, that's right. And so, say you're in a hurry and you didn't sure. you didn't uh, take care of yourself in a in a hygienic fashion, and you could become the the nidus for a huge outbreak of things, including Jernia. Yeah. Well, speaking of food, <laughs> this episode is brought to you by Blue Apron, where they can provide fresh, high quality ingredients. Free of norovirus or giardia. Yeah, right. And that makes a real difference. So it's important to know where your food comes from. No question. Blue Apron is the number one fresh ingredient and recipe delivery service in the country. They set the highest quality standards for their community of over 150 farms, fisheries, and ranches all throughout the continental United States. And for less than $10 a person per meal, they can deliver seasonal recipes along with exactly the amount of each ingredient that you need. And you on your own can make delicious home-cooked meals in 40 minutes or less. Nothing like making your own meal, knowing what the material is that you're making it from. They ship exactly what you need for each ingredient, so there's no waste and no overeating. Their mission is to make incredible home cooking accessible to everyone. They deliver to 99% of the continental U.S., and there's no weekly commitment, so you get deliveries when you want them. Choose from a variety of new recipes every week, or you can let them surprise you. Uh, so here's some upcoming res- recipes for this month. Warm smoked trout and asparagus salad with fingerling potatoes and garlic croutons, spiced zucchini enchiladas with creamy lime and tomato rice. Elote-style vegetable tostadas with summer squash, poblano peppers, and cilantro rice, and peach honey glazed chicken with mashed sweet potatoes, collard greens, and Thai basil. You can customize your recipes every week depending on your dietary preferences, and they have a freshness guarantee that promises every ingredient in your delivery arrives ready to cook or they will make it right. Check out this week's menu. Get three meals free with your first purchase with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash twip, T-W-I-P. That's blueapron.com slash twip. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home meals with Blue Apron. So don't wait. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. I love Blue Apron. I don't have to shop. That's the worst part of cooking. I enjoy cooking. I enjoy preparing everything putting it together, but I don't like shopping because inevitably I forget something, and here they will they will deliver it all to your home. So check it out and, and use our TWIP promo, blueapron.com slash TWIP. All right, we have a paper for you, a very interesting paper. Uh, now, Dixon has left, but Daniel, you and I can start. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I guess he's coming back. <laughs> you know, he's uh, he's older. He's got that bladder thing going. Maybe there. <laughs> talking about seven different kinds of stools, you know, made him need to uh, go to the bathroom. All right. Our paper's from PLOS, Neglected 
tropical diseases. It is called single sex infection with female schistosoma mansoni creates cercariae. Sorry, no create. Schistosoma mansoni cercariae mitigates hepatic fibrosis after secondary infection. And the first author is Nicole Kozlowski. They don't have asterisks, but the first two authors do have asterisks. <laughs> <laughs> They're actually yin yang symbols, right. which is so yeah. cute. And the second author is well, co first author, Martina Sombetsky. And the last author is Emil Reisinger. They're from the uh, University Medical Center in Rostock, Germany. And they are also from, uh, from Vienna, the Far- Medical University in Vienna and the Popper Laboratory at the Medical University in Vienna, Hans right. Popper. Right. Schistosomes. Indeed. Wow. Dixon and Daniel, 258 million people are currently yes. being treated for schistosome infections. Indeed. Uh, remind us how you get these infections. Well, you just go swimming in fresh water where the snails are that are shedding saccharia, which is the infectious stage for people, and uh, they seek you out. And they find you, and they penetrate through a hair follicle, mm-hmm. and they initiate the infection that way. And where do they go in you? Well, the first thing they do is they stay in the skin. Right. They, they drop. They swim with a tail. So as they penetrate the hair follicle and go down the shaft and enter the bloodstream, they actually shed their tail at that point. And now they're just this little sort of a roundish mm-hmm. object with two suckers, and they they secrete things through the anterior sucker that allows them to penetrate into the uh, dermis. Mm -hmm. And that's where they sit for about a day and a half to two days where they undergo some morphogenic changes. And at that point, they re-enter the bloodstream and then they travel throughout the body and they then go to the lungs Mm -hmm. where they acquire their cloaking devices. Mm -hmm. And then they travel from there to the liver where they mature as adults. And that's where they find each other by pheromonal attraction, and then after mating and remaining as a couple, the male actually engulfs the female in his gynecophoric canal. They migrate against the flow of blood from the liver into the mesenteric venules. That is, at least two species do this. Hmm. Uh, Schistosoma mansoni does this, and uh, uh, Schistosoma mekongai. Um, and him, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, Mekongai does this as well. Uh, and that's where they sit, and they carry out their lives by eating blood and uh, shedding eggs. So the eggs are the problem, right? The eggs are the problem. They say here they're tissue-damaging eggs. They are. Why? And that's because of the immune responses we make that's against ex- them, That's right? exactly correct. Which we're going to learn okay. about here. Yeah, well, there's another thing that happens, though, too, and that's they plug up the pre-sinusoidal capillaries of the liver because half of them – migrate out of the body yeah. by actually penetrating through the small intestine in order to get to the lumen. That's how they get out. So they damage tissue by that mechanism. The other half of the eggs that are produced are washed back into the liver. I see. They don't quite make it into the liver. They, they get stuck in the presinusoidal capillaries, and they block it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How long would it take <clears throat> from the time you pick up a cercaria Till the time you show some symptoms that cause you to seek medical help. Right. Well, one won't do it. Uh, you need more than one because they're either male or female. So let's say a pair of worms. You could tolerate a pair of worms for the rest of your life and you'd never know it. Mm. All right. They don't produce enough eggs to actually plug up your liver enough to cause a problem. But over 100 to 200, it depends on the number uh, and mm. the number of eggs produced per female worm. And the species, it varies with the species. I see. Uh, over 200 worms, it's considered to be a pathogenic situation which causes clinical symptoms. Got it. As they say here, over they have a lifespan of 15 years. They do. Wow. They do. That's where that cloaking device comes in. It, it allows the adult worms to avoid immune attack. Daniel, can you summarize the two phases of the of the uh, pathogenic immune response? Basically, mm. I, I could. First, I'm going to jump in a little bit with the clinical. Yeah. Um, yep. The clinical. So the two sort of numbers. The one is that there's about a quarter billion people in the world that are on medicine to protect them to prevent schistosomiasis, um, but despite that. There's another about 300 million people that are that are still infected. I see. Uh, right. With over 90 percent, or I'll say 90 percent of that number being in sub-Saharan Africa. Right. Um, 
Um, I should just say in Africa because there is, you know, when you get up into Egypt, it's not sub-Saharan Africa, right? No, so there's, no, I'm just going to say Africa. Right. Um, so there's a tremendous disease burden here and a tremendous amount of effort to pr- try to protect people. Mm. And then um, as Dixon, I, I love when Dixon does these life cycles because <laughs> I, I, I just, <laughs> the, the emotion and excitement. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> that he brings to that. No, I mean, when and you I were love gone, him. I love when, him. When, when, yeah, I, I can tell that when, you know, when you were gone and I was going through the, the life cycle, I, I don't like great. the life. No, you did fine. Yeah, you did I don't like. Fine. I don't like the life cycles because I know where it's headed. I mean, these poor <laughs> suffering people. Right, right. But, right. Um, but yeah. So the clinical manifestations actually are tied to this whole life cycle, and mm-hmm. you know, as mentioned, uh, species dependent. Sometime between four and eight weeks is when we have the pulmonary um, phase, and we have this yeah. this Kadiyama fever, which so there's there could be. An acute, right? So this is the yes. acute manifestation. Yes. Yes. Um, again, with heavy exposure. And this was originally described um, in the Kadayama district of Japan. Um, and then there's the then there's the late stage. So this early stage, they could have a febrile, flu-like um, cough, headache, breathing problems, um, eosinophilia, right? And then later on, what we're really focusing on here is this chronic. Um, pro-fibrotic um, response that That's can develop. So um, here they're again reminding us of the two immune um, approaches, the TH1 and the TH2. So there's a transient uh, TH1 yes. um, response uh, with the, we'll say the signature cytokines, interferon gamma, TNF alpha, um, inducible nitric oxide synthase. Um, and then there's this pro-fibrotic um, TH2 response, and that's going to be mediated by IL-4, IL-13. So there, there is this dogma about you know this, but as we're going to see going through this paper, maybe the dogma has a little bit of uh, subtleties that can be exploited. Mm. Uh, so the, the, from my understanding, the initial TH1 response is suppressed by the onset of egg laying. Right, yes, and then yes. that causes this TH2, which is actually damaging because it causes the, that's right. uh, the fibrosis, that's right. right? Yes. And, and that's true. I mean, the interesting <laughs> issue is that most of our pathology that we're seeing here is occurring in the liver, and it's an immune, an yeah. over-exuberant immune TH2 yeah. response. Yes. So the idea here is that let's vaccinate people with one sex. That way they can't make eggs, right? That's right. Because if you only have a male or a female... There's no way they can make no eggs. eggs. That's right. And then maybe that'll be protective. Maybe. And there has been some history <laughs> which with different react outcomes, right? Many, many, it, many it, trials. You know, <laughs> yeah. So this this reminds me of a question I was going to throw to Dixon. So, you know, people often characterize these uh, schistosomes as sort of the swans of the uh, parasitic world, right? You've got this <laughs> wonderful male and he's got his uh, sort of wrapped around holding right. on to the That's female. Right. That's right. Um but my understanding is the females kind of leave and come back, leave and come. They don't always come back to the same male sometimes. Sometimes well, they'll come to us. Have you heard this rumor? I have not, but I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> Nature is filled with those kinds of situations. But that's not a swan-like behavior, though, is it? <laughs> that's more like a uh, promiscuous bat, <laughs> I guess. which which does have uh, that one of its features. But, yeah, this, this parasite... Um, has so many nuances because it lives in so many different places throughout the host during its life cycle, and it induces so many different kinds of immune responses that it's difficult to keep track of everything all at once and to know what's important and what's not important. So I've I've lived through a, a host, no pun intended, of of attempts to define the characterization of antigens that induce protection, and we've gone from secreted products like glutathione as transferase enzyme, to tegumental proteins that are shed on routine basis, to uh, proteins which are actually shielded from immune attack by the inclusion of host proteins onto the surface of the parasite itself. And it's thought that that is part of the cloaking mechanism that it uses to avoid immune attack because it it sort of hides its uh, susceptible epitopes by uh, including host proteins like Provence serum albumin and cattle, Mm -hmm. human serum albumin and those sorts of things. And on top of that, the parasite produces a a beta-2 microglobulin-like molecule onto its surface, which Mm -hmm. confuses the macrophages as they come along and sort of immune survey and then say, are you friend or foe? And it takes a look at this parasite and it's just enough like normal 
bit of two microglobulin that it says, oh, you're probably mm. one of us, and it mm-hmm. just keeps mm-hmm. moving on. It doesn't have the eyes to see the fact that this is gigantic worm sitting in my mesenteric lymph node, <laughs> venules. <laughs> For God's sakes, don't you see it? It's right in front of your eyes. And the answer is, no, I don't see it because it's got the wrong signature for me to see it so people have been frustrated in terms of knowing where to go next in terms of finding the antigens of importance that's that's this, basically it yeah i was going to say this is almost a throwback right this is, is instead of instead of it the is. molecular biology instead of isolating mm-hmm. a specific excretory yeah. or secretory product yeah, yeah let's just let's just give them the whole the whole organism sure. let's give them only one sex so that there's an That's exposure right. but That's without right. a propagation right. let me just uh, interject here too because there's a there's a history of exposure and protection. If you look at the epidemiology of schistosomiasis in all these endemic areas, you will see that schistosomiasis, the clinical aspects, are a, sort of a preteen age to about an early 30-year-old adult person. That's, that's the, those are the people that are sickest. And then after that, you see that if you start looking at egg production as, as a, an indication of the acquisition of the infection, you can see egg production going up over the pre-teenage years as they're exposed to water, as they, they bathe and they swim and they do all those kinds of things. And then there's a plateau, and then the egg production starts to go down as the adult worms die. And they are still exposed to the water, but they don't acquire new infection. So the, the thought was that, what is the basis for that? And the answer turns out that uh, there's an equivalent with bird schistosomes in people called swimmer's itch, where you can become exposed to saccharia from bird schistosomes by swimming in water that uh, are flyway zones for, let's say, ducks and geese and swans, et cetera. And they shed their feces in the water. The eggs are contained there. They have their own cycle of schistosomes. But they don't carry out the complete infection in humans. Once they penetrate the skin, they get stuck. And they die. Mm-hmm. And as they die, they elicit this immune response, this is eosinophil base right. with IgE. Right. So so some people in Iowa, actually the Woos, used irradiated saccharia from schistosoma hematobium and schistosoma mansoni to prove that that stage alone with repeated exposures that don't allow it to go on to complete the infection are enough to protect against the live mm. infection. So the antigens that are that could be used as a preventative for preventing infection altogether uh, exist in the saccharial stage of this infection. And I don't know why that mm-hmm. hasn't been exploited more because of the modern technology. How long would uh, a single-sex infection last? A single-sex infection would probably last as long as a double-sex uh, infection because, remember, the adults are, are cloaked with they this. Can, they can live a long time. They can live a long time. 15 so. years. That's right. But, but okay. as this paper will indicate, this is... This does not induce the kind of protection that you want from an infection. Well, in this paper, so they do single-sex infections, they and do. they measure, they do this in mice, they measure Th1, Th2, granuloma, right. and hepatic fibrosis. And liver enzymes. Liver and- enzymes. They use uh, circaria that have been propagated in snails. This is remarkable. The, the biology here is fantastic. <laughs> Which I want to say, the snails are kept in aquarium water on a lettuce diet. That's right. That's right. Oh, <laughs> well, they're easy to keep. <laughs> lettuce? <laughs> they're very easy to keep. And they they take single circaria and they so they expose the uh, the the snails to a single circaria and then they can tell what sex so it's is. It's the single right? mericidium. It's the mericidium stage. That mericidium. Frozen. Pardon me, yes. That's okay. That's okay. I even that's, have it highlighted. You know here. what? That's why I'm here. <laughs> Sex of the circaria, which then they produce, are that's determined right. by DNA amplification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they have primers for sex-specific genes. They do, the W. Because they want to know what they're putting into the mice. That's exactly so they right. give mice, they give mice a priming thing and then a challenge. So exactly. they go nothing slash male-female. Right. They have male-female slash male-female. Right. Male slash male-female. Right. And Female slash male female, all the possible combinations. Exactly right. right. Exactly right. And then they see what happens. Yes. Don't don't you also <laughs> wonder why just this particular strain of schistosomes? Uh, yeah, tell me, tell me why. Well, I they don't know why because if you look uh, at other places where schistosomes, Belo Manson, Belo Horizonte, you can find <laughs> the same sequence in males as in female adult schistosomes. Mm-hmm. 
And they said maybe it's because of some degenerating in the code on usage or some. They, they invented some crazy uh, explanations for this. But in this particular strain of Schistosoma mansoni, the female chromosomes are identifiable only in females. I see. And not in males. And so they're, they're very sure of the results that they're getting. But you couldn't do this in another place, like in sub-Saharan Africa, for instance, because the males and females share the same sequences in there. So they were very lucky to have a strain of schistosoma hematoma, a mansoni rather, that, that you could distinguish the males from the females with, with 100% accuracy. Okay. So let's look at the livers. Oh, yes. <laughs> As Julia Child would say, save the liver. You know, I got to say that naive, they have pictures of all these different groups, right? They do. They do. Naive one looks great, right? Yeah. Lovely pink. That's right. And the, all the others are dark. Exactly. <laughs> so mm-hmm. even the ones, the, the, the female slash male female, they say smooth surface, no macroscopically visible nodules. Yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't look great to me. Does it look good to you, Daniel? None of it looks good. <laughs> Just the night. Actually, the Just spleen the doesn't naive. look too bad. Yeah, the, the spleen, spleen is, looks okay. It's but pretty small. Clearly, there's something going on in that liver, right? But of course, when you've got the eggs plugging up pre-sinusoidal yeah. capillaries, that's what you've got, actually. Um, but And the other groups are even worse. Right? They're even worse. So that male-female, male-female, huge liver, all dark. Right? right. So the difference is, and you'll get to that, I'm sure, so I don't want to spoil it. Yeah, you, but, can, uh, you can talk. Well, it's the size of the granuloma around the eggs that make the right. difference. That's basically what this discoloration is. Grayish about. nodular livers. Exactly. And they're bigger, so they weigh more. They are. Cause right. they're, because they're getting portal hypertension developing. They're getting yeah. backing up of blood. They measure some liver enzymes, ALT, AST, elevated in all groups. I'm confused on that one, Daniel, because in human schistosomiasis, human liver function tests are pretty good, actually. Yeah? Yeah, they are. The parenchymal cells are not not affected by this disease. It's the precytosolal capillaries that are affected. So liver enzyme tests are, are usually normal. Yeah, no, I mean, so definitely true, and um, I'm trying to reconcile it here. Well, it because may, the mouse model be is incomplete. The mouse model so that, is not a great model. Yeah, That's, so one, one issue would be that, and the other is also the chronicity, right? If we look at this, so they're they're doing an initial infection, right? Right. Um, and then they're doing a, a sort of challenge at yeah, the that's right. That's right. right. That's right. So th- this is really an acute process that we're seeing here, right? We're not yeah. we're not following these mice out for you know years, which most of the pathology we're seeing in schistosomiasis is years later. And right. you know, you see these kids, and they've got these distended bellies, That's these right. really large livers and spleens. So yeah. um, that may be, you know, and and unfortunately. Um, any sort of, um, say, cirrhotic process or uh, process that affects the liver, over time, you are going to destroy so much of the liver that there will not actually be a lot of AST, ALT elevation because the liver has actually been replaced with scar tissue. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Um, and so I, I think maybe there's a timing. There's a lot of factors here. but Could be. Um, but but it, I it think is, it's an incomplete model, yeah. by the way. It's not a perfect match for human infection. Yeah, you almost have to choose, like, what, what are the parameters that you think are, are informative here? So one of the things I think um, makes sense is to look at the liver um, and spleen sort of weight and size, right? Because that's mm-hmm. going to be part of the pathology. And so visually as well as graphically, you see that a naive um, liver and spleen size um, compared to the others, the, the MF slash MF is going to be the largest, right, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, as far as volume. Um, and the female, then MF, is going to be the, the smallest um, as far as volume. Um, Which, by the way, is a remarkable finding in itself. I mean, that's a fantastic result, I think. Yeah. It's very, very, very clear. Mm. You don't need statistics to give you this result. Yeah. You can see the difference right but away. But it's not zero. It's not yeah. zero. But look at the size of the granuloma that the eggs make from the female-only infections. It's almost non-existent. Yeah, so there's a nice picture there of... Of the granulomas, and you can yep. see that, right? Parasite I thought lo- that was pretty impressive when you shift to figure three and look at the size <laughs> of the remarkable. granulomas. Yeah, yeah. But I, parasite loads are not different in any of them, right? That's right. They're all the same. Is that something you would expect? Well, because there's no immunity against the adult stage, that's why. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's interesting because yeah. we're not we're not worried about, and I think that is an important thing. We're not worried about killing the schistosomes. What we're actually worried about here is not having this over exuberant immune response. And Correct. so, you, you get all this data in Figure Two, but when I mean, you get to Figure Three, and you see, well, let's really look microscopically yeah, at yeah, the yeah. granulomas, That's the pathological right. process. It's greatly diminished when you do the female challenge first. It's greatly, greatly diminished. <laughs> it's yeah. almost non-existent. That's yeah. that's a key to and, and it's interesting that the male doesn't have it nor does the male slash female have it as a pair so that probably implies mm-hmm. that the substances that are inducing this change by single female infections right. the protein that does that is pretty, probably being used for something else during the mating process and it never gets ex- the host never gets exposed to it because it's being used for something else mm-hmm. so that, that's remarkable too that mm-hmm. shows you that uh that the biology of this parasite has yet to be fully explained. That's that's basically it. So then, Daniel, they look at Th2 responses, right? Yeah, I you know when I go to can I jump to Figure Five because I ahead. thought that was the interesting. You go to Figure Five, and now they're looking at Th1 versus Th2, and they're using different cytokines. They've got TNF alpha, interferon gamma, IL12, P70 as our Th1 markers. And the Th2, we've got IL-4, IL-10, IL-13. And the the big ones to contrast would be the um, MF slash MF and then the female first slash MF. And so, you know, it's interesting when you look, you're, you're basically getting just a more robust immune response across the board from the MF MF. So if you look at TNF alpha, you look at IL-4, um, both much higher. The female first infection, not a lot of IL-4, a lower level of TNF alpha, mm-hmm. minimal IL-13. Um, you see one sort of outlier with IL-10 coming up. Um, so, it, I mean, I, I think they're sort of trying to push here with the argument that it's a skewing, but if anything, it's almost a decreased responsiveness. Oh, they want to say there's no TH2 response in the single sex yeah, they do right. want to say that. But I, I think you could get away with saying that. I yeah. think that's definitely compared to, you know, if you use IL-4, use IL-13, yeah. um, you see an exuberant yep. MF slash MF level um, where you're basically just at background um, and, and with our female first. As far as TH1 goes, it's very interesting that um, in, in, for some of the cytokines there's in the MF, MF, there's no production, but the single sex do pretty well, and I guess that's because the eggs are not suppressing, right? Mm-hmm. Could be. Or the, the, so you do put MF eventually, and I presume at some point they're making eggs, but somehow the previous presence of F or, or M alone has prevented the suppression caused by the uh, the eggs. But would you yeah. would you agree with that? I would. I think that's reasonable. Sure. Daniel, what is this CTLA-4 expression ah, about? Yes. Can you explain that? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but would you, you know, explain? <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering, I'm wondering if we came up um, with this before. So this is, a, this is an area, I guess, that I'm particularly interested in because it's the idea that um, certain cells can put something on the surface to basically shut down the immune response. And mm-hmm. so I think we've talked about um, PDL one mm-hmm. right? program, right. death like one. Right. So CTLA-4 is another, um, uh, I'll say, antigen protein that's become quite popular in the whole immunotherapy uh, cancer arena. Um, and I, I think uh, – Former President Carter, right, had therapy um, in this in this area. So t- CTLA four will actually turn off our T cell cytotoxic response, oh. and um, so it's you know think of it mm-hmm. as a T suppressor um, modality, a T suppressor um, antigen or protein. Mm-hmm. And so um, they're actually talking here, and they talk about CTLA-4 expression, saying it inhibits the Th2 response and was higher in the group that was female versus MF. So, so you're actually getting an, an mm. active suppression of the Th2 response by getting the female exposure first. So maybe that's what happens early in infection, before the eggs are made in a normal infection. And this is prolonging it because there are no eggs initially. Yeah. I mean, somehow by getting the female first, they're actually developing um, regulatory T T cells, so Treg yeah. cells. Yeah. They're showing with Fox P3 expression in these. They're getting a CTLA-4 expression, which is this um, turning off of mm-hmm. the TH2 response. It's really it's interesting because we always thought of, you know, oh, there's an immune response or there's a lack. But there's really, when you have a lack of immune response, it's a dynamic 
regulated process. So it's very active to not have immunity and immune response. So as you look at this infection over time, epidemiologically in age, various age groups, and you measure the diameter of the granuloma around the eggs in the liver by taking a biopsy, you will find that over mm-hmm. time, the diameter of the uh, granuloma in a chronically ill patient decreases. Okay, so the old eggs induce big granuloma, and the newer produced eggs produce smaller granuloma. And in the future, when they live to the age of 30 or 35, and they're still producing some eggs, those granuloma resemble the ones of a single female infection. Mm-hmm. So there is a gradual increase of perhaps this cytokine that you're just referring to. In the old days, they thought there were suppressor T cells that were right. produced, but that's actually not the case in this. Since it's really interesting. They've right. they've renamed. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so suppressor T cells be, became very quickly. Um, I don't know Replaced. taboo. But <laughs> That's then right. yeah, but That's then right. they became T regulatory cells, which are apparently great, and we can there talk about them. But, there you go. So it's interesting. That early on, there was actually a concept um, that there was an active calming of the immune system and i think now the the mechanisms have been understood and all the different markers right. So. Yeah. right they just had an incomplete dictionary of lymphokine language yeah and some of some of the, i think the early work was maybe driven more by theory and bias than the actual data and i think now we have the data yeah that's right so they, these authors say our findings show that protection against egg induced granulomatous hyperreactivity is achievable yes. using gender-specific differences. Yes. But it's not going to be by this approach. It's no. going to require something else. They're going to have to find out the, the active ingredient in yes. female worms and then exactly. use that. Exactly. That's correct. That is correct. Yeah. And that's, and, um, that's going to take some time. It will, although the entire genome has been sequenced. How many, how many genes out. are encoded in this genome? That's a hell of a question, and I don't <laughs> commit that kind of stuff to memory. I can look. Do you it know up. how many genes you and I have, by the way? Well, it's approximately twenty-three thousand. Yeah, something we like don't that. Know. Give or take twenty-three. That's 000. right. Give or take. That's right. It's it's humiliating to know that there are plenty of organisms out there that have many more genes than we do. <laughs> hmm. So that's I don't know. It doesn't. I don't know what it means to be human. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> but, and you certainly say, can't define it by the number of genes that you've got, though. That's for sure. Oh. It, it is interesting, though, I have to say. You know, <laughs> you just sort of make this assumption, I think, as a human being, that uh, <laughs> right. organisms all have, like, chromosomes and then a, a, a pair of sex chromosomes. And uh, the, the schistosomes do, which is interesting. Yes, they do. Yes, they, have they do. seven regular autosomal pairs, and then they've got yeah. a sex pair. So it's pretty yep. pretty sophisticated. I mean, these are, these are eukaryotes. These are right. advanced, complicated organisms. They are. And they have survived quite nicely. Thrived. 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 Exactly right. All right. Shall we move on? We shall. Okay. Let's see. That was a I great think, pick, by the way. I think we have a new case study coming up. We do. And um, yep. let's let's now announce our, our reward, right? Great. So of, for this case study, which we will solve in a couple of weeks, yep. we'll take all the people who get it right. Yeah. And randomly pick a winner of a, a hardback edition for this one of the sixth. Sure. The sixth edition That's of Parasite. Is that so, something you're willing to give away? You bet. You have any? Are you kidding? You had a pile of them. That's the whole purpose of this program is to give them away. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we it, just put in an order to print another thousand. So we are uh, nice. We'll, we'll have more. <laughs> we'll All have right. more, and so we can even offer a Spanish edition to those people that would like one. <laughs> Wow. That's Actually, cool. that's true. Let us know if you prefer it in English or Spanish. That's right. Well, the winner will, will get that information from exactly right. Now, Daniel, what have you got for us? Indeed. All right. So <laughs> I hope people enjoy this one. Um, <laughs> enjoy. <laughs> I'm going to sit back and relax now and listen. No, no, you can't. You have to uh, participate. You have to add color commentary. Yes, you can add them. So right. this, was a, this was a case that I came across. A colleague of mine was... Um, was talking about some management challenges they were having with regard to home care for an individual, a patient that um, had been seen in the clinic, uh, but this patient was living in Queens, and uh, the challenge was, how are we going to get the home care that this patient needs? And so the story was that this was a man uh, living in Queens, and he had a wound on his foot, um, and this wound on the foot needed daily care. So the story is this man's been living in Queens. He's been living here for about nine months. Um, And he recently developed this very painful blister on his foot. And 
what did he do? It was burning. He uh, put his uh, he put his foot in water. I'm not sure if it was a tub or a bucket, what sort of water. And um, when he did this, he he got great relief. It felt so much better, and this this tense blister actually opened up and uh, relieved. And so the man was concerned though, because when he looked at the uh, the opened lesion, now it did not look so normal. Um, he noticed there was actually something in the blister. And so he went and saw this um, parasitologist, and uh, the parasitologist uh, noted there was something there and actually started to wrap it around a, a small, um, like a toothpick type <laughs> piece of wood. Oh my this God. is true. This is true. And now, so the challenge is, um, you know, how are we going to possibly get this gentleman living in Queens uh, daily care for this, this thing he's got um, in this blister in his foot? Um, I'll give people a little more information. Um, you know, a person had not um, previously ever seen a physician or had any surgeries. Uh, didn't know if he was allergic to anything because he'd never taken any medicines or so Western medicine, shall we say. Um, didn't know much about his family history as far as um, any diseases. Not currently taking any medication. Um, he is new to he is new to our country. Um, you One know, would the, guess. Yes. <laughs> Where was he before? Just the speculation off the top of my head. So that's going to be a question I'm going to put out. You know, where where could this man have possibly come from? Right? That's right. That's right. Um, he said he's new to this country, and it was about nine months ago that he moved here from a um, from a rural part of some country. We're going to have to sort of guess where that might be. Mm, nice. Um, and in his in his home country, he lived in a rural. Um, I'll say. Uh, resource limited region hmm. okay so uh, people people have a lot of questions here what what could this possibly be right uh, i mean what are we doing seeing this in queens right um who's willing to drive out to this man's house and, and what kind of care does he actually need <laughs> right um, Nix, Nixon and I already know the answer. Yeah, we do. And I think most of our listeners will they guess should, if they've been listening to twip right? <laughs> this is all true <laughs> everyone should get it I don't know. This is not a very common disease. No, it isn't. <laughs> yes, and it's becoming less common by the day. <laughs> but the presentation is quite unique. I would say it's very descriptive <laughs> if you had to ask me. And you don't need a stool chart for this. No, one. you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> this is wonderful. You need a bigger toothpick. That's what I was so saying. We want people to, to think about where this patient came from. Yes. Right? And not only what, what he has, but exactly. where he could have acquired this. Exactly right. The, the other thing I'll ask people to do, and this is sort of, I guess, this is a math question, is, you know, so so initially I was like, I'll drive out there. I can I can go to Queens every day. Well, how many days is really? it going to take? Mm. So do the math. How many days is it uh -huh. going to take for this man to basically get his full treatment and no longer require care? Very interesting. Right. And right. uh, can he be taught to do some of this himself? Yeah, is it something he could do himself? Is it a is it an uncomfortable treatment that he's going to have, right. or is it just sort of a daily do this every day and, and it's all good? And was this person surprised to learn what he had, <laughs> or did he actually suspect? <laughs> was he familiar with, was the, he condition? Familiar with the condition? Yes. That's right. That's right. That's a good, that's a good question too. Right. You know, yeah, people yeah. here would be like, "What is that?" But maybe exactly. this man is aware of what what this is. Right. All right. Great. Well, send your guesses in. And amongst the winners, we will pick one at random. That's right. To receive a hardbound copy of Parasitic Diseases, the sixth edition, courtesy of Parasites Without Borders, LLC. You bet. That's, That's right. Great. And then the next time we'll give away your... Uh, people, parasites, people, and plowshares. parasites, and plowshares. Exactly. We do have three emails. Let's just go through those we before do. wrapping up. This is from Mark, or who read our uh, his you know his guest today but we we got this after the fact last time hello to this week in parasitology it's parasitism not parasitology right, 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 right. hosts vincent and dan you'll be nice to dixon who is away traveling the world <laughs> below is my diagnosis for case 133 late in the show you vincent requested listeners to send in an audio file so anyone else wants to do that i think uh, yosef did it once yes 
I have fun. I am having fun generating an audio file for this letter on my Mac using Siri's voice. <laughs> Let's see how Siri pronounces the names of worms that are suspected. The names are <laughs> Tinea solium, Tinea saginata, or Ascaris lumbricoides. <laughs> Eggs of these parasites are spread through contaminated water, food, or soil. Daniel's case notes indicated the young patient lived in a rural area in a house with dirt floor and drank untreated water from a stream. <laughs> this establishes risk factors and possibility of infection. Given that she is physically smaller than a younger sister, indicates a nutrition problem. Her protuberant belly, hard to the touch, is consistent with a large mass of parasites. Three candidate worms uh, need to eliminate some. The girl's diet is described as plantains, rice, beans. This eliminates Tinea saginata, which passes from cow to human during its cycle. Tinea solium is eliminated as it passes from pig to human. This leaves Ascaris lumbricoides. Hmm. The final piece of evidence is that the girl's mother observed a long-moving worm in the girl's feces. To me, this piece of evidence validates the diagnosis above. As described in Parasitic Diseases, 6th edition, T. saginata is a segmented worm, and its proglotted pieces may be observed in feces. T. solium is also a segmented worm and can be eliminated for the same reason. This leaves Ascaris lumbricoides as the parasite. The CDC's website lists treatment with albendazole, mebendazole, or ivermectin, mm -hmm. noting that the FTC has not approved <laughs> albendazole for treating Ascaris. In ancient history, when I started listening to TWIP, <laughs> Dixon described Ascaris lumbricoides in episode 21. The episode's image was a disgusting-looking jar filled with dead worms. <laughs> For those interested, it's TWIP21. Keep up the good work and be nice to Dixon Mark. <laughs> <laughs> They're all nice to me now. Dixon, yes. take the last one. We only have Anthony, one. Anthony writes, here's a believe it or not feature. A freshwater mussel produces a fishing lure, you should have put that in quotes, to attract fish to be infested with the mussel's eggs. And they actually are parasitic to fish. They actually burrow underneath the scales, and they uh, insist as little black dots. Hmm. And there's a there are two references for both of these. And another one is that Black Owls Park Flying Fox study to test for waterborne parasites. And now I read that, but I don't know what it means. So what is this? Black there Owls is, Park Flying Fox. Study. This is from uh, Australia. To test for waterborne parasites. No, Newcastle. Where's New? That's the UK, right? It is. The risk of bats bringing parasites into the hunter's drinking water will be studied. Ah, uh, I got it. I see. I got it. So the gray-headed flying foxes in Blackhall's Park. Oh. They're worried that, and they have a nice picture here of a flying fox flying above the water. It it's so like pretty. Australia, not. Uh, mm. Yeah, they they're probably Australia, not the um, not, UK. Not, not the UK. I don't think no. they have those in the UK. No, they don't. Okay, so that's cool. $28,000. You're not going to get a lot done for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dixon, the first thing is the muscle makes a lure. Yeah. What kind of a lure is this? Well, it's like it's a, a wiggly worm. thing. It's like a worm or some sort. The fish is attracted to it. It comes over, and then it sheds the eggs. The eggs hatch. They they swim around, and then they find the fish <laughs> and go under the scales, and then the fish becomes a, a peritonic host to carry the muscle from place to place. The fish is not harmed. No, not at all. And if we, in fact, we, no, you're not harmed by eating it either. Okay. I I used to vacation with my family up in New York State to a lake called Auger Lake, and it was infested with these mussels. And most of the smallmouth bass and the perch mm -hmm. and the pike, they all had these little black um, larval mollusks underneath I their see. scales. So we used to eat cool. them. We're fine. Believe it or not. Yep, I believe it. All right, that's. <laughs> TWIP135, you can find it at Apple Podcasts, microbe.tv slash TWIP. If you like what we do, give us a little support. Go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. Uh, you could do a Patreon thing where you give a buck a month. You could give PayPal, other ways as well. We'd love to have your support. Send us your questions, comments, and guess, guesses. TWIP at microbe.tv. Daniel Griffin is at Columbia University medical school and also at parasites without borders.com thank you daniel oh pleasure as always dixon de palmier is at parasites without borders.com the living river.org trichinella.org dixon welcome back and thank you thank you had a great time i'm vincent racaniello you can find me at virology.ws the music you hear on twip is composed and performed by ronald jenkies you can find his work at ronaldjenkies.com 
You've been listening to This Week in Parasitism. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back soon. Another twip. Is parasitic. parasitic.